welcome to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This ministry is founded on Mark chapter 1 and verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. After seeking the Lord in prayer, our name was given to us by the Lord. And we invite you to like us on Facebook, The Voice Crying in the Wilderness, where you can download our messages or you can email us and I will provide that uh, email address at a later time. And uh, however, if you use either, either one of those, you must know your speaker's name and the day that they spoke. Again, our speaker for this evening is Sister Patty Bond, and um, we have her on the call, and uh, she will give us our opening prayer and our evening devotion. Uh, Sister Bond, the time is now yours. Okay, Sister, thank you. Um, let's just start with a, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Please, Lord, lead me now uh, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, I, I'm Patty Barnes, and I'm an instructor and the director of the midwifery program at Harlan College. Tonight, I would like to share with you just a few of the many astounding wonders of childbirth. Much of this material I'm about to present to you this evening, you can find in my design, Divine Design series on 3ABN. If you are able to watch that series, you will be able to see many graphics that help illustrate the wonderful facts and features of creation in childbirth. And you will see that we do have a wonderful all-wise creator. It becomes more evident as we consider how we all develop in the womb of our mothers. You know Thomas Edison's story, right? He was a genius that invented the light bulb. You probably remember that he failed hundreds of times. He learned from his failures, and he kept trying until he finally was successful in creating a working light bulb. Think how much planning, calculating, and experimenting that, that required. Well, the evolutionists want us to believe that mindless matter, or Mother Nature, could accomplish something far more technical, complicated, and comprehensive than a light bulb. Indeed, a living, breathing, fully functional baby. But bear in mind, trial and error with hundreds of failures like Edison's had just won't work. If nature couldn't get it right the first time, well, that's the end of mankind. To complicate matters even more, not only must the baby be a success, but the entire procreation process as well, with both male and female. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, we read these amazing words. Then the, Lord, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Note that God formed him in the womb. That applies to all of us. Of course, we are not all called to be prophets in a matter that Jeremiah was, but the fact still remains that we were known of God before we were even conceived. And he does have a plan for each of our lives. In Psalm one thirty-nine thirteen, we read this, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me, in my mother's womb. Some people believe in a creator who merely set the world in operation, like a winding up a clock and then allowing it to run its course. But as you can see, God is not just a bystander. He's actively involved in the formation of every individual. The next verse says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. The word fearfully comes from a Hebrew word meaning reverently. And wonderfully is derived from a Hebrew word meaning differently or distinctly. So each one of us 
was reverently and distinctly made. Each one of us is a unique individual. You and I have been specifically designed by God. Why is it that law enforcement officers take fingerprints? Obviously, because of the fact that no two fingerprints are alike. We also know that two, that no two eyes are alike, which allows for eye recognition. There's now technology for facial recognition for the same reason. It should come as no surprise that no two brains are designed alike either. The initial creases and grooves in the brain form a unique brain print, if you will. And through modern science and technology, we have been able to explore into the development of the baby in the womb to at least grasp some of the wonders that God performs to bring a new life into the world. When we take just a peek into this amazing process of the creation of life in the womb, we will marvel at God's hand. Just this little glimpse will be enough to cause you to say with the psalmist, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now first let's look at the experience of John the Baptist in in utero. Before he was even born, we read that he was filled with the Holy Ghost in Luke 1.15. His life was already planned, and God knew him and recognized him as an individual at the moment of conception. It reads, for he, John the Baptist, shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. In Luke, we also find that John leaped with joy in the womb of his mother when Mary came to visit. He already was filled with emotion and he rejoiced. The mystery of creation from just Conception to implantation into the uterus is amazing. How a tiny egg cell divides and travels through the fallopian tube with thousands of little cells as escorts, like nursemaids, supplying the egg with all it needs is simply fascinating. After the egg is fertilized, it will take approximately around six days of travel to arrive at the uterus, where the multi-divided cell, now called a blastocyst, is implanted and will now rest till the placenta is formed, that amazing organ that will be the baby's life support system until he or she is born. It is not difficult to see the parallels between reproduction and the creation week. There were divisions. The Lord divided the water above from the waters beneath. He also divided the dry land from the waters. He built a support system necessary to sustain life first, and then he created the animals and man. The Lord created for six days and then rested the seventh. Before we move on, we need to take just a quick glimpse at the placenta, the support system that God has put in place for the developing baby in the womb. The placenta is the most remarkable organ of the human body, yet just a temporary organ performing performing many tasks. Now let's look at some of these things. Did you know that the placenta brings oxygen to the baby and carries away carbon dioxide and waste? It also stores carbohydrates, protein, calcium, and all the nutrition. It then releases them as the baby needs them. That's why it's so important to eat healthy, so that the proper nutrition is available to the baby. Also, the placenta provides the hormones that help maintain pregnancy. The placenta has to serve as the baby's lungs, digestive system, liver, kidneys, and immune system. What an amazing organ. It also offers protection for the baby from many harmful bacteria and substances. But there are some things that can cross the placenta and adversely affect the baby. We call these substances teratogens. Now, these are substances or factors that can cause congenital malformations in the developing baby. In other words, they adversely affect the growth and development of the baby. 
some of the more common teratogens are drugs and medications, alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine. Most people know that drugs may be harmful to a developing baby, but not everyone is familiar with the dangers of alcohol. Some birth defects associated with alcohol may be stunted growth, brain, kidney, and heart damage, a small head, misformed faces, low IQ, and alcohol addiction. Where the baby has even withdrawal symptoms, the term for this is called fetal alcohol syndrome. So please, if you know anyone that is pregnant and drinks alcohol, please tell them it will pass to the baby. There is no safe amount to drink. And please ask them to think of the welfare of their baby and abstain entirely from this teratogen. Now let's consider smoking. Did you know that cigarette smoke contains thousands of harmful chemicals that may cross the placenta? And here, here's just a few. Nicotine is a harmful substance that constricts the blood vessels, depriving the baby of precious oxygen and nutrients. Then there's carbon monoxide. This is a poisonous gas that depletes the mother's blood of oxygen. Cyanide is a poison. As the body tries to expel it, there's depletion in protein and vitamin B12. There's tar, and this sticky brown substance damages the baby's lungs. And there's lead, and this can damage the baby's brain. And if that isn't enough to concern you, smoking is the single greatest factor in low birth weight and a contributor to miscarriages and premature births and also increased risk of SIDS, which is Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. I also should mention that I was at a conference recently to get some needed CEUs for continuing education. The lecturer was talking about the use of marijuana. Now that is legal in some states. He was clear that it should not be used by pregnant and breastfeeding mothers. It has all the toxins in it just like cigarettes, and much worse. It can cause low birth weight, placenta problems, infant death, prematurity, hyperactivity, poor IQ, and et cetera. He went on and on. He also said current evidence indicates while breastfeeding, it may adversely affect neural development and lead to poor mother memory. Some other tragedies is include the pesticides and radiation and certain viruses. This is why it is vitally important for mothers to abstain or stay away from these health-destroying substances, especially when pregnant. The essential nutrients, hormones, gases, and antibodies from the mother are exchanged in the placenta. The mother's blood is pumped to and from the placenta, while the baby's blood is pumped through the cord to and from the placenta. But amazingly, their blood never mixes. The cord is the lifeline from the mother to the baby. This should remind us spiritually that Christ is our lifeline, linking humanity with divinity, our hearts to his heart, and providing everything we need to live the Christian life. In the devotional book, Our High Calling, page 45, We read about that lifeline. It says, measure the cord if you can. That has been let down from heaven to lift man up. The only estimate we can give you of the length of that chain is to point you to Calvary. I recently taught a certified childbirth education and doula course this spring. And one of my students wrote a wonderful review of her experience. And I like what she said in her letter comparing what she learned about the placenta with our spiritual life. She said this, according to 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, says, Jesus is the only mediator or bridge between God and man. Hence, Jesus is like a placenta where the nutrients are the physical blessings, the oxygen, which is spiritual gifts, protective antibodies, which is mental endowments, from the Father is passed on to us. 
And the waste products, which is our sins, or I call them teratogens, are passed on to Jesus and continue to pass to him every time we sin. He bore our sins on the cross of Calvary. When we ask for forgiveness and repent of it, he pleads before the Father the merits of his great sacrifice, and the Father accepts it. Then it's excreted from the Father's circulation, which it means spiritually erased from the records. Praise God that through Jesus' work of mediating, we are reconciled with the Father, our sins wiped out, and our pages are made white and fair. Isn't that beautiful? Let's go on now. As a baby is delivered at birth, the Lord provides miraculously for the baby's own organs to take over now, which by then are fully formed. The lungs, kidneys, the liver, and other organs take up the work that the placenta has been doing for the past nine months. This transition has to take place almost instantly. Right at birth, a miraculous change must take place in the baby's circulatory system. Up until now, the blood has been bypassing the liver and the lungs and detouring around these major organs. While the placenta was temporarily performing those functions, these detours are called shunts. At birth, the blood is able to continue Now, straight through the liver and the lungs while the shunts and bypasses begin to shrink and disappear. Isn't that a miracle? Another marvel of creation is the restriction of blood flow in the umbilical cord. There's a strong muscle-like tissue that surrounds the cord and begins contracting, clamping down on it. There is an amazing substance called Wharton's jelly that has been serving a very important role while the baby was in the womb. This jelly-like material has helped prevent the cord from kinking and pinching off the blood flow, so necessary for the baby's survival. Now this jelly serves a different and opposite purpose. After being exposed to the cold air, it begins to condense and harden. The result is a restriction of the blood flow to and from the baby now. This prevents excessive blood loss for both mother and baby. Then when the cord finally gets clamped and severed, the blood flow is completely channeled back into the arteries. Now all the plumbing is reorganized so that a baby's organs can do all that the placenta was doing. All of this takes place in just a matter of minutes. But right here, we have to ponder another amazing transition. The baby has been completely surrounded by amniotic fluid. Now when he is delivered, he must begin breathing air. Would you believe that modern science hasn't figured out just how or why the baby takes his first breath? We have some ideas. But nothing conclusive. Jesus obviously provided for the breathing to begin, and maybe someday we'll figure it out. As you can see, this entire process of fetal growth and development and the birth of the baby is just not possible with evolution. Allow me to share what Charles Darwin admitted in his book on the origin of species. Quote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But I can't find out no such case. Well, Darwin, living in the mid-1800s, obviously knew nothing of this miracle of childbirth. Here his theory does indeed absolutely break down, not just once or twice, but countless times. One little glitch in this process and there's no baby and no second chance to get it right. Well, it should be obvious to everyone that none of this could be possible, possibly happened by chance. We are truly fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, after the baby is born, another miracle must take place 
to save the mother's life. Contractions eventually cause the expulsion of the placenta. When this happens, as many as 20 severed arteries are left behind with the potential pouring out about a pint of blood every minute. Since the average woman only has around five or six quarts of blood in her body, depending on her size, you can see the emergency situation created here. Within 10 or 12 minutes, all her blood could be drained. But there's no need to panic. In God's infinite wisdom, he provided each of the severed arteries with a precisely placed muscular sphincter that closes off the vessel like a hemostat, pinching it closed to prevent loss of blood. This amazing process takes place so quickly, on average, only about a pint of blood is lost. Again, evolution could never have accomplished this. Nature can't say, oops, we blew it that time. But maybe we'll get it right the next time when we figure out how to stop that blood loss. Getting back to the placenta, how thankful we should be for this disposable organ. It has performed its task well and is ready to fade away. This is not just some old tissue we called afterbirth, but the support system that provided for the baby all these months in the womb right up until the day the baby was born. Like so many other morals of creation, we simply take it for granted. Since we are still on the subject of the placenta, I should not fail to mention something that weighs heavy on my heart because the devil's like a roaring lion lion, and he wants to distort God's beautiful creation and pull mankind down to mere animals. He has introduced some animal practices that are widely accepted in many circles, including Christian circles. And one of these practices is eating the placenta. We will readily admit that there are vitamins and minerals in abundance in the placenta, but to eat human tissue is nothing less than cannibalism. For a time, mothers were being encouraged to cook the placenta, but now the practice of dehydrating it and encapsulating it has become popular, not to mention lucrative. Let it not be forgotten that while there may be some nutritional value, there is also grave dangers in this practice. The placenta acted as a filter and a barrier between the mother and the baby, blocking many harmful substances. It also contains blood and waste products that should not be ingested. It's time that Christians exercise their God-given common sense. Just because some animals might eat the placenta, it's not a reason for us to do it. Many animals eat almost anything, including feces. A dog will consume its own vomit. Contrary to the theory of evolution, we are not mere animals, but we're created in the image of God. Let us act like it. You can learn more about New Age practices if you watch episode number nine in my Divine Design series on 3ABN, if you're interested in learning more about this. But let us return once again to Psalm 139.13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. The word covered comes from the Hebrew word sakak which means to entwine or to weave or knit. Did you know that our skin is miraculously woven? The strength and flexibility of our skin is on account of the way it is woven together. In verse 15, we find this truth repeated. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. The expression curiously wrought comes from the Hebrew word rakam, which means embroidered or weaved. With that in mind, let's look at how masterly we are woven together. Not just our skin, but every organ and tissue of our body. Perhaps you have wondered as I have, how from a simple egg cell we get a fully functional baby with all its parts, and systems. 
we might be able to grasp the cell divisions, but how do we explain how each cell knows what to do? Even more incredible, how do they all know how to interact in order to form anything? How is it that the genes are able to turn on and turn off? How is it that all the components work in harmony, like the bones, the organs, the tissue, etc., to form a living, thinking person? It is no wonder that more and more biologists are believing in a creator. Solomon, the wisest man on earth, said, As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Ecclesiastes 11, verse 5. We can appreciate the word of God and that we are all truly, fearfully, and wonderfully made. And just as a baby that develops in the womb is perfect in every stage of development, so are we as Christians perfect in every stage of our development. John 3.3 3 says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We are to be born again. And in every stage of our new life, we can be perfect. Not complete, but perfect as long as we cooperate in obedience to him. Jesus taught this principle when he said, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Mark 4.28, these natural rules are a great parallel in what the Lord would like to do in all of us spiritually. Now I want to mention another thing the Lord has created for the baby while in the uterus. When he or she is born, they came they come out with a creamy a uh, waxy-like substance all over their skin. This is called vernix caseosa. In Latin, vernix means varnish. And caseosa means cheese. This covers the baby's skin and protects it during the time in the womb. But this is no mere skin cream. It is also made up of antibiotics that protect the baby's Skin from infections. It has enzymes, proteins, and other valuable properties found in vernix. And can you imagine what would happen to your skin if you were in water for a long time? Well, it would wrinkle up like a prune, wouldn't it? God gives the baby a skin cream that protects him from this, even over the course of nine months in amniotic fluid. In addition, this creamy substance has many immunity factors built in. Amazingly, vernix caseosa is unique to humans, not being found in any other mammals, including primates. Jesus, the creator of all life, made special provisions for the human baby, didn't he? So I have touched on some of just some of the highlights of God's divine design in a developing baby. And again, you could see the entire series on 3ABN YouTube channel if you wish. But now I would like to talk to you about some counterfeit truths in the field of midwifery. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are keenly aware that Satan counterfeits truth. And this is true in nearly every area of our work. Where God gives us instruction, counterfeit theories come in to unsettle our faith in our practices. Just as there's a counterfeit righteousness by faith in which people are taught they are only to believe and have faith, no works or effort is required. The devil counterfeits our health message with the same theory. Just believe in divine healing is a cry from so-called faith circles. They don't see the importance of of lifestyle changes in cooperation between the human and divine. And this opens the door for spiritualism. Satan inflicts an individual, then he lifts the infliction in order to ensnare him in er erroneous ideas and beliefs. The person never learns nor cares to learn about the laws of hell. The practice of midwifery has also seen the introduction of these counterfeits. The just believe theory is gaining much ground in the Christian world, and unfortunately, even among Seventh-day Adventists. 
So midwives are teaching to simply go to a birth equipped with nothing but their Bibles, trusting God that everything will work out fine, and if they pray, and just believe. All they need to do is quote the word and catch the baby. If they have enough faith, that is. How thankful we are that the Lord has given us counsel in this area. The spirit of prophecy helps us have balance and gives us an anchor to keep us from getting carried away with the wind. In Nine Testimonies, page 176, says women should be educated and trained to act skillfully as midwives and physicians to their sex. This is the Lord's plan. Also in Medical Ministry, page 61, it says, Our institutions should be especially thorough in giving women a training that will fit them to act as midwives that understand well their profession. Just like with righteousness by faith, just like with medical missionary work, we do need to have faith in God. Midwives should constantly be cultivating faith and trusting in divine power. They should always ask the Lord's blessing on their work and the use of the natural agencies. But faith works in harmony with our efforts. A medical missionary, which, by the way, should include all of us, is counseled to know the human machinery. We are to learn how the body works and reason from cause to effect. And the same holds true in midwifery. We should have well-trained, educated, competent midwives who can minister, minister with skill while trusting in divine aid. And another counterfeit or myth is the concept of painless childbirth. Here, the teaching is that since we are redeemed from the curse of the law, the curse of multiplied sorrow in birth is removed from the woman. In addition, the definitions given for sorrow, pain, travail, anguish are applied to a mental state and not physical. Only these definitions and illustrations that fit their teachings are used to support their ideas, while the other definitions are neglected. Again, they say if you have enough faith, you should not have pain in childbirth. They don't really understand the anatomy of the human body, do they? Without contractions, this baby cannot come out. The question should not be whether or not we have enough faith to escape the pain, but rather how we will approach the pain. Pain can be a positive thing here. A skilled midwife can coach and encourage a mother through the pains of birth with the help from an assistant and alleviate some pain through use of hydrotherapy and other comfort measures. But these measures will not slow down the birth from happening. It has been my experience that those mothers who approach the birth pains with confidence, courage, and faith in God for endurance through the pain do better and the birth goes smoother. Those who are believing for a painless childbirth tend to have the most difficulty because of the principle of mind over matter. You see, your mind can actually convince yourself not to have contractions. But then progression stops and they are at risk for stress of the newborn and then can be led to a C-section. I know this might, this might sound very far-fetched to some of you, but I've actually seen this happen. And I like to warn people, especially medical missionaries, helping in this capacity to beware of this practice. There is a reason why the Bible often uses the analogy of a woman in labor or travail. Nothing seems to come closer to explain the pain and struggle that takes place before a tremendous blessing is experienced. The scriptures speak of the church in travail and the world itself in pain to be delivered. Jesus used this illustration to explain to his disciples that the sorrow they were about to experience at his death would be followed by great joy. That's in John. And in John 16:21. We read, a woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. In Second Timothy 2, verse 15, we read, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And this applies in spiritual 
and medical matters. Now I would like to close with this passage from Patriarchs and Prophets. And this starts on page 115. God is the foundation of everything. All true science is in harmony with his works. All true education leads to the obedience to his government. Science opens new wonders to our view. She soars high and explores new depths, and she brings nothing from her research that conflicts with divine revelation. Ignorance may seek to support false views of God by appeals to science, but the book of nature and the written word shed light upon each other. We are thus led to adore the Creator and to have an intelligent trust in His Word. No finite man can fully comprehend the existence, the power, the wisdom, or the works of the Infinite One. Says the sacred writer, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Is it as high as heaven? What canst thou do? Deeper than hell? What canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Job 11, 7 through 9. The mightiest intellects of earth cannot comprehend God. Men may be ever searching and ever learning, and still there's an infinity beyond. Yet the works of creation testify of God's power and greatness. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show us its handiwork. Those who take the written word as their counselor will find science an aid to understand God. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share some of these wonderful works of creation in childbirth and I truly hope that you have been blessed. My website is uh, ministryofmidwifery.com. If you have any questions, my email is patty, with an I, P-A-T-T-I, at ministryofmidwifery.com. Now let us uh, close in prayer. My dear Father, help us now, no matter how humble our task may be, and that everything that we do, that we bring glory, and honor to Christ's name and character in his strength and by his grace we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Um, we thank you so much. You know, um, I definitely personally would like to go back and um, go to the YouTube channel and just to see um, the 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 handiwork of God and you know when you think about it how we are just fearfully and wonderfully made Amen. and uh and how much God really love us you know what he put in to provide us you know everything we need you know I always thought also I am a mother however mm-hmm. um I always it always never ceases to amaze me how this baby this fetus can grow and live in water, <laughs> but <laughs> once it come out up under water, it will drown. It's just amazing. But um, I will go back, and I'm quite sure our callers have been richly blessed with this message this evening. If it's possible, Sister Barnes, can you give us more information, like? Um, your contact information again, and can you share the uh, 3ABN information? Yes, yes. Uh-huh. thank sure. you. Okay, um, again, when you when you go to uh, 3ABN or you type in 3ABN, there will be a separate website. It will say 3ABN YouTube, and you can click on that, and it goes to all their YouTubes, and then a Above, uh, it will say. You, then you click on video, and then once you get video, it will it will have a whole bunch of their videos. Um, um, then you you just have to scan down till you see, or you just type in. You can just type in Divine Design 3ABN, and that should come up. Um, there's 13 episodes, 
and when you see the illustrations it will be it will be it, they're 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 amazing to see then <laughs> and they're not long i mean each episode's only 15 minutes but it's packed full of information and um my again my um if you have any questions my email is patty p a t t i at ministry of midwifery dot com. And I also have a website, just ministry of midwifery dot com. Amen. Amen. Uh I know like I I stated earlier that I have been richly, richly blessed. Um just thanking the Lord for all his many, many, many manifold blessings. Um, so, uh, you can hear this call again, and I'm quite sure we may want to, or we can always go, um, and like she said, uh, Sister Bond, and get more information. Um, you can hear this call again by dialing 712-775-7089. The PIN code you will use is 555-145-POUND. This call will be available until our next call, and um, our speaker for tomorrow is, give me a minute, I'm trying to pull it up, um, our speaker for tomorrow is Brother Bert Leverett, and that is our speaker for tomorrow. On Friday, we have Pastor Kerry Rogers, and that is our lineup for the week. If you like a um, CD for this message with a $5 donation, you can send that in to the voice of one crying in the wilderness, P.O. Box 8441, and that is Laverne, California, and that is 917-508441. If you choose to use this method, uh, please put on your check or money order. Uh, payable to Vaughn Williams. That's with a V. B A U G H N. Please continue to send in your prayer request. Uh, you can email it. You can post it on our Facebook page, or you can text the call Sister Jackie. That's myself at seven seven three four one five one five six two. We want to thank all our callers for uniting with us in your daily prayers and or your financial support for our speakers. 